Amen. Well, I know this is a little different. This is a different scenario. We're back to watching at home and sharing together. It's a little different. It's, it's different being up here and not seeing you out here. But I'm going to encourage you as we continue and as we always do at Valley, I'm going to encourage you, and it may seem a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to encourage you to stand where you are and let's read God's word together today as we enter in. Today it comes from John 14, and it says this. In verse 15 it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I'm going to have you sit right where you are. Thank you. And let God's word fill us today. You know, again, this is a little strange. It's a little strange for us. We're not, we're not seeing you out there, but, but I'm going to imagine that you're here with us today. You know, one of the wonderful things of that, that, that through all this craziness of, of this pandemic, one of the, one of the things that, has, that we have found to be true is that God cannot be stifled even amongst the pandemic. That, that we have been blessed with technology so that right there at home, right where you are, you can experience God's word and you can experience worship just as though you were here. And it may feel a little different, but friends, what a mighty God we serve and an opportunity that we can still gather together in worship. Today, we're going to, to continue uh, studying. Uh, we, over the last several weeks, we've been studying each, each key component to what we call the Apostles' Creed. And we have spent the past several weeks discussing the very power, majesty, and nature of God the Father. And as I, as I think this, I want to stop just for a minute. And I'm going to ask you at home, and I, don't, I think we might be able to bring it onto the screen, but we, for the last several weeks, have been reading this together, what we call the Apostles' Creed. And I want to stop before we go any further, and I'm going to bring it up in my inference, and we have it on the screen. If we could bring that up as well at home. And I'm going to encourage you to read this with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into death. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is what we call the Apostles' Creed. That's the title, the name it's been given. And over the last several weeks in this series of the Creed, we've spent the past uh, several times discussing each key component of what we call that creed. We have continued to discuss the coming of Jesus Christ uh, at the time of his birth into humanity. In just a few weeks, and, and friends, you've got so many shopping days left, in just a few weeks, we are going to celebrate Christmas. That's the birth of Jesus Christ. Over the past several weeks, we've been, we've been continuing to, to spend on the concept of the very power and majesty and nature of God the Father. We've discussed 
Jesus' birth, coming as a small child, living the perfect life, a life free from sin, his crucifixion or his death, his resurrection, and the fact that he is coming back again on that day of judgment. We've also discussed in detail Jesus, his ascension into heaven so that he could sit at the right hand of God in order to stand for believers, in order to forgive us of our sins, as Scripture teaches us, and intercede on our behalf so that we, friends, may have security and hope of eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. And now we've come to the next point in the creed as we read. Where today we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit. Now, as I was preparing for this portion of the series, I came to the opinion, and, and maybe it's just my opinion, but that very often we don't spend the time on this dynamic and essential aspect of the Trinity of God. The Trinity of God being God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, if you think about it, we we, we just sang some worship songs, and and we do that week in and week out. We, we, every, every Sunday or Saturday or whenever that time is that we worship together, that we gather together, we mention the name of God the Father. We mention the name of at every single worship opportunity experience of Jesus the Son. And I don't discount that. I don't argue against that. I think that is vital. We, we talk about, uh, through, through Bible study and, and all of our small groups, and, and even as we sit together, we talk about the importance of reading and studying God's Word and applying those truths to everyday life. But amidst all that, very often, sometimes we don't even think about it. Sometimes we miss or we set aside the concept of the Holy Spirit. Not today. Not today, friends. As we worship together, I want us not only to learn about the Holy Spirit as this part of the creed, but also how we as the church should worship this essential portion of the holy union of the Trinity. I'm going to read this again, John 14, 15. I'm going to start there. It says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. This is Jesus speaking. He said, To be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not, in verse 8, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, He it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, verse 22, Judas, and it's very clear, it says, not Iscariot, this is not the Judas who betrayed Jesus, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? See, I want to stop right there. The disciples were asking Jesus a very important question. Probably one that that you and I, if if we were in their shoes, if we were at that moment, we would probably be asking the very same question. Jesus, when we look at this scripture 
And if we do it too quickly, if we, if we just fly past it and disregard it and just read it word for word and we don't stop to study, it would seem that Jesus' answer that he's already given might be a little bit confusing. I mean, on one hand, he says, I won't leave you alone. But then on the other hand, he says, in a little while, I'm going to go away. On one hand, he said, in in other scriptures, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then on the other hand, he says, but now I must return to my father. I could see where that might cause some stress. That certainly caused, if we, once we go, we're going to continue through through some other scriptures where it, it caused some tension amongst the disciples, amongst the apostles. But really, if you stop, and and that's what we're going to do today, we're going to stop, slow down, and understand that Jesus has already answered the question that Judas asked. He's already answered it. But then he stresses on, and and follow me if you're you're following in your Bibles at home. In verse 23, Jesus' answer is this. If anyone loves me, He will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Now, friends, if you get nothing else out of today, I want you to understand this key doctrine, this key doctrine of what we call the Apostles' Creed, that the Holy Spirit is that manifestation. The Holy Spirit is the manifestation of what we call the triune God or the Trinity that God sent to earth. Scripture tells us that that aspect, that manifestation, that part of God is here amongst us today. Scripture right there in 14, it says he will be, the Holy Spirit will not only be with you from the time that Jesus ascended, but will be with you forever. That means until Jesus comes back again, which we've talked about previously, and Jesus will return. But Jesus, out of that, out of his love, and God the Father, out of his love, sent the Holy Spirit, that third part of the triune God, that third part of the Trinity, he sent, he was sent here for us. Now, I already said that my key concern is is that the Holy Spirit is often neglected. Why is that? It's very often, in my opinion, in my study, in in my time, that it's due to, one, a lack of understanding of the Trinity, where we, we, have, we have sometimes have trouble with the concept of a God that is three parts, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all three separate parts, but all still that one God. We know that God the Father is, is, it was creator of heaven and earth, stands and, and is in heaven. And, and he breathed life into this, what we, this universe. He created all things. We know, as we've talked about, Jesus, the Son, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, came as the Son of God in order to die on the cross out of love. And then, as, as, as Mike has talked over the last couple of weeks as well, Jesus ascended back to heaven, but sent the Holy Spirit. All three working together in unison as one part. The glory of this is, when we truly understand the Trinity, is that there has never been a time in life 
and the creation that God has ever left us alone. Whether it's God the Father, we look in the Old Testament and we see the, that God appeared in the, in the temple, or as a plume of smoke or a plume of fire, we see that manifestation. We see it in Jesus Christ and, God, and as Christ was here on earth and, and taught and during his time and his ministry to the point that he died on the cross until Jesus ascended and then the Holy Spirit came. God, three in one, is always with us. Now, but again, we, that, maybe that's that understanding. Hope we have a better understanding of the Trinity. The other thing I think that my concern is, is that maybe we have concern over the supernatural aspect of the Holy Spirit. Now, this may be in, in, in perceived in different ways. This is what I see. Maybe by... I don't know if you're, maybe you've been with somebody who has said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, or the Holy Spirit told me this. And you stand and you go, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. That it, maybe it makes us a little uncomfortable, maybe it makes us a little nervous. Part of it is, I think, also, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, but potentially that we're uncomfortable with the idea in our brokenness in our sinful nature, we're uncomfortable with the concept that God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son are, are there with us day in and day out through the power of the Holy and presence of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. The next time maybe you sin or maybe you fall, what you think, maybe you're falling away from God, to know that God, through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, is right there with you. That might make you a little bit uncomfortable, that, that Jesus and God the Father are here through every action. They witness every action that we do through the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. But Scripture is very important. Jesus very importantly teaches us right here in, 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 four, in John 14, as well in other things, that upon his ascension, upon Jesus' ascension, the Holy Spirit was sent by God the Father in the name of Jesus the Son as what? Three different things. One, as a helper. Jesus knew that when he ascended into heaven, he didn't want to leave his apostles, his followers, and, those, and us now, today, that, that call upon the name of Jesus. He didn't want to leave us alone. So he spent, sent the Holy Spirit as a helper. Now, in other texts, this, we're, this is the English Standard Version. In other texts, uh, other versions, it uses the word advocate or counselor. I like that idea of a counselor. I've, I've been a counselor through, through many years, helping people, uh, trying to, to counsel families and counsel married couples and individuals to make decisions that are right according to where they are in their faith, make their decision right according to where they are with their family, and guiding them through challenges and, and in some cases growing in their faith. That's exactly what Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit does. He is that counselor. He is that helper that guides us through the challenges of life. Challenges us to grow in faith. How does he challenge us? And he get, makes, helps us with that. And we're going to break these down individually here in just a moment. But the other thing that, that Jesus says in John 14 says that he is not only a helper, but he is a teacher. What does a teacher do? Well, a teacher brings understanding. A teacher helps us in knowledge. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. Bringing understanding of the Word. The living word, the Bible that, that, we, that we lift up and, and we honor, that God is speaking to us through, how we discern is right here. Bringing understanding of the word and the purpose of a life found only in Jesus Christ. But there's one more thing that, that Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will do. 
He serves as a reminder, as a reminder to the truth of God's love and to the sacrifice that Jesus made, that everything that Jesus taught while he was here on earth, that reminder is there through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. My friends, what a joy it is understanding that the Holy Spirit serves in this capacity, that we are never alone, that we have through every aspect, every part of life, through God's word, we have, and through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, that manifestation, we have a helper, someone, something to help us through, a counselor to guide us along the way, a teacher to help us discern and understand God's word and how to apply it to our life. And then that reminder of the truth of God's love and that sacrifice that Jesus made. It's a reminder about how the love that God the Father has for us that he would send this part of himself to earth while Jesus returned to heaven to prepare, prepare for those who call upon the name of the Lord. These characteristics of helper or counselor, whatever word you want to use there, teacher and reminder are important for the believer but I would say even more important potentially for the non-believer. Now, as you're sitting at home, because you're not here amongst us, as you're sitting at home, I want you to think throughout, as we, as we continue to unpack this, where are you in your stand? Where are you in your walk? Maybe you haven't even made that step to believing in Jesus Christ, believing that God the Father loved you so much that he sent his son, to die on that cross for you and for me to have hope and forgiveness of our sins and eternal life and salvation, what we call the gospel. I want you to think about that. Because if you're sitting at home and you're a non-believer, if you have not made that step, I'm going to challenge you to understand today that the Holy Spirit is there for you. How? Why? Why? I'm going to go over the John 6, chapter 16. Now, this is another encounter with the, the, the disciples and Jesus. In John 16, 5, Jesus says again, But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. See, the disciples are upset. They know Jesus is now going to leave them, and they are heartbroken. They don't know wh what's going on, even though Jesus has already spoken to them about this. Certainly, the disciples did not want for Jesus to leave them. That seems logical. That seems rational. That seems normal as a human being, as someone who, who calls myself a, a follower, a disciple of Christ. I wouldn't want Jesus to leave me either. If I, were, if I had Jesus right here next to me, I wouldn't want him to leave either. I don't think you would either. Neither did the disciples. But Jesus has already explained that his purpose on earth is just about complete. And he said in chapter 14, he had already said that he has to return to heaven to prepare for what is to come. But he says this in, in verse 7 of 16. He says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Let me read that again. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, this is important for the non-believer. It's important for the believer as well. When he comes, he will what? Convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. 
concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Jesus says right here, friends, in black and white, or maybe it's in red if you have that text in the Bible, if you have that, that type of Bible, but in black and white, in print, and for us right here, but he's saying directly to the disciples, clearly that it is more important for him to return to heaven and send the Holy Spirit than it is for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to remain on earth. Why? Well, again, we have to understand the purpose of each part of God. God the Father, creator of the universe, understands the brokenness of his creation, the brokenness of man. This thing we call sin. Sin does nothing but break us away from God, drives us away from God. It drives a wedge between us and God. It drives a wedge into what God created as perfect communion and relationship with him. That's what sin does. But God the Father desires for his creation to again be in his presence. So what does he do? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, second part of the Trinity, who was fully God and fully man, immaculately conceived and born, lived the perfect life as a human being without sin, so that out of love, love for man, for humans, for human beings, loved us so much that he died on the cross for our sins. But then he conquered death, and then he said, I'm going to ascend to heaven. Why? To prepare a place for disciples and followers of him. That's what he says in, in John 14. He says, I go and prepare a place for you, for there are many rooms. But out of his love and concern, he's saying, I need to, in my, in, in my presence, I, I need to go back to my father. I have to do that. Why? So that I prepare a place for you. And while that, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send another, another aspect, another part of me as a helper, as a teacher, as a reminder of what the other two have done. See, and then he says, the Holy Spirit is going to do one thing. It's going to convict the world of sin. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sins. It's not, it's not guilt. It's the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit moving in us, teaching us, that we need to be convicted, we need to be broken of our sin, of our sinful ways. The Holy Spirit is essential, friends, to our life. The Holy Spirit is worthy of equal worship because the Holy Spirit is still God, still Jesus, serving as that counselor, teacher, reminder. He is that conduit to God in prayer, our guide and the convictor of our sin and the declaration of God. He's going to convict the world of their sin. He's going to teach about righteousness. He's going to discern all these things and convict us to, to for us to understand. Conviction is simply that we understand that we are broken, that we are faulty, that we are frail, and that we are weak in our sin. That the wages of our sin is death. But the understanding that Jesus Christ as we are convicted of our sin, we have the opportunity to accept the love of the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. Accepting that when that non-believer is convicted of that sin, and maybe you've, you've made those choices, maybe you haven't, maybe you're on that, 
that brink in, in your walk. But I can tell you, when you are convicted of your sin and you accept and understand that Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord over all of the life, the Holy Spirit then moves and it consumes you. And then the Holy Spirit grants believers the ability to understand the Word of God. The ability to understand the Word. That means that these these words on the page, they come to life because we have a desire to, to dive into that Word. We have a desire to learn every day more and more about the truth that is found within these pages, the truth found in the living Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit that grants us as believers the ability to understand this word. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. In in chapter 2, he says this, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God, for who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. That was a whole lot. In other words, Paul is saying this. Paul is admitting that it is the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that is giving him the ability to make the case for Christ. It's not all his knowledge and his education and it's not his, his ability to, to turn a phrase or, or to, uh, as a fine debater or as, as a fine apologist. It is the very presence and power of the Holy Spirit. That, to me, that is an amazing revelation. Paul is identifying or giving credit where credit is due. He's giving credit to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I feel this is uh, potentially also sometimes where we begin maybe to confuse or neglect or even fear the power of the Holy Spirit. Just a couple weeks ago, I was sitting sit in a meeting and, and somebody said uh, something to the effect was, if, if people truly understood the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, we all would be better off. We all would live life better according to God's will. Maybe that's true. I think that's what Paul's point is. But let's be honest. If someone starts talking about the Holy Spirit moving through them or guiding them to say something or act a certain way, let's be honest. There's a lot of times, there's, there's times that our first instinct is to go, wait a minute. Explain this to me. The, a spirit is talking to you, the Holy Spirit, or sometimes we, we misinterpret this and, and call it the Holy Ghost. That's not a, a, a good concept in, in our conversations. It makes people maybe a little bit nervous. Paul identifies right here, friends, that it is his ability to understand the love of Christ. 
It is the apostles' ability through their experience with Jesus Christ that gives them and, and the promise that the helper came, moved through them, and identifies that they are speaking with the authority of the Holy Spirit because they have experienced, friends, the firsthand, the love of Christ. And understand the presence of the Holy Spirit as that counselor and teacher and guide that Jesus promised. The Holy Spirit is God's presence on earth. The Holy Spirit is God's presence inside of every believer. Friends, you're not here in this room with us today. But the amazing point of this is, as Bible te- the Scripture teaches us, that when we gather together in the name of the Lord, it, it doesn't mean that we have to gather in one common space. It means that when we together or we're with maybe a small group or one or two, two or two or three people, that when we call upon the name of the Lord, when we dive into God's word, we then feel the very presence of the Holy Spirit because that is who is with us at that time. That's the amazing concept that I want you to understand today. That the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. The Holy Spirit is at work in the life of the church, in the life of believers. That's exactly what Paul is stating here in the text. Because when we understand and we recognize that, that the Holy Spirit, his presence is there and at work, and, and we understand that we're born again, that we become saturated with the experiences of the Holy Spirit. And that moves us to understand that the Holy Spirit not only conv- has convicted us of sin, has consumed us, and taught us to to better understand God's word, and then the Holy Spirit unites believers in purpose. What is that purpose? It's the purpose of furthering the kingdom of God, to furthering the gospel message. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want to stop for a moment. If you get further into that passage, that that idea of speaking in tongues, what it says is they went out from that place and they began to each began to share and worship in a, maybe even their native tongue or in a tongue that they haven't, that means another language. And it, and it, scripture says that, that all these, the people around it, that they were watching what the, the consuming fire, the consuming presence of the Holy Spirit was doing that all these people were beginning to hear, maybe for the first time, what we now call the gospel. They were hearing, maybe for the first time, in their own language, the love that Jesus Christ has for them. The others who didn't want this to be getting out, they, they accused all these people of being crazy and even being drunk. And if, I'm going to encourage you, well, I'm not going to read it right here, but in Acts 2, just continue to read that because Peter takes that opportunity and says they're not drunk. They're consumed by the power of the Holy Spirit. They are sharing what they know. They are united in one purpose, and that is to share the love of Christ. Friends, that is where we are today. That is what the presence and power of the Holy Spirit does for us. It unites us in purpose. I heard it once said that we who believe in Jesus are going to live together in heaven forever and ever. 
So we may as well be good friends while we're here on earth. We're united in purpose. We're united in knowing that, that God is with us, that Jesus died for us, and that the Holy Spirit is amongst us. Acts chapter 4, 31 through 35 says this, and when they had prayed, this is another encounter, when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the, the apostles were given their testimony to the res resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Just as it was then, so it is today. We are united in purpose. We are united through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. We are united to further God's kingdom. It is God's desire for you and for me and for all who claim the name Christian or disciple of Christ to grow and grow closer and closer to God into the day Jesus returns. And friends, he will return. The reason above all else is why God the Father and Jesus the Son sent the Holy Spirit so that we could be filled and the, feel the very presence of God. How could we not feel joy in this? As we walk, friends, more in the Spirit, we will become more mature and bear more fruit. And when that comes, the Holy Spirit does this. He empowers believers to live their life boldly to live a life boldly, courageous, to be willing to share and stand for what they believe, stand for the love of Christ. Romans 8, 12 through 16 says, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. This is important, friends. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. A theologian named Oswald Chambers once said this. He said, the spirit of God is always the spirit of liberty. The spirit that is not of God is the spirit of bondage, the spirit of oppression and depression. The spirit of God convicts vividly and tensely, but he is always the spirit of liberty. God who made the birds never made bird cages. It is men who make bird cages. And after a while, we become cramped and can do nothing but chirp and stand on one leg. Friends, it came to me sometimes, and I have lived this life this way, but, but I, as we grow, we are to live life boldly. Not that we're to go, go out and do whatever we want and, and become a, a, maybe a daredevil and, and say, well, you know, I'm going to heaven, so... I'm going to do, I don't know, I'm going to go jump off this bridge. That's not what we're talking about. We're about, we're talking about sharing the experiences that we have every day in our walk 
acknowledging that Jesus Christ died for every sin that I committed, every sin that you committed, every sin that we're going to commit, and was willing to die on the cross so that we have hope, not of this world, but for the next. Because we can ask Christ to forgive us of those sins. And we are forgiven of those sins and cleansed. Friends, very often we are more concerned about what not to do as a believer than we are and, and, and should be mindful. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be mindful in those areas. We absolutely should be mindful of where sin can creep in and, cre and create a stronghold. Absolutely, we should be aware of these things which take us away from the life that Jesus paid for us. However, too often we only focus on the things of sin and death. And Scripture tells us that we are free when we allow the Holy Spirit to enter in. Verse 3 of this passage, if you, when you back up, Paul writes this. He said, for what the law was powerless to do, it was weakened by the flesh. Now, if the law was powerless, meaning what's written is powerless, this gives us the implication and evidence that the Holy Spirit then empowers us to live. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live out a life in strength and joy, not in weakness and fear. Now, I want you to read that passage again real quick, right there in verse 12. Right at the beginning, it says... So then, brothers, we are debtors. We are debtors. Uh, other version, versions of, of phrase this that say we, we have an obligation to God to live according to the will and purpose of God. Simply put, friends, we are either children of God allowing the Holy Spirit to move us and guide us to live out boldly, to grow in our faith, to grow in our walk every day, or we're not. There, there really is no middle ground here. At the end of the day, I come back to scriptures like Romans 8. At the end of the day, I come back, and it brings my focus back to the power and the goal to live a life not to simply avoid sin, but to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's what Christ did. That's why Jesus, God the Father, Jesus the Son, sent the Holy Spirit for us to live out each day boldly for Him. boldly in the confidence to know that the price has been paid for our sin. That we are debt-free because of the love of Christ. That our sins, every sin, is forgiven when we ask to be cleansed of that sin. I'm going to close you with this. Joel chapter 2. I'm going to always go oh, back to the Old Testament. This is a, a challenge to when, when Christ comes back, the day of judgment. But I, I think it, it puts into perspective what should be how we prioritize the Holy Spirit. Joel chapter 2, 28, 32 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. My challenge to you, friends, is this. How do you prioritize the Holy Spirit? Do you live each day the very first part, have you been convicted of your sin? Do you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you and convicting you of the way you're living life? Do you feel convicted to ask forgiveness for those sins and to put away those things, to put away and out of sight, out of mind, to put them away and focus now on the hope of eternal life that Jesus grants you? Do you live a life of understanding and growth in his word, daily in his word? Do you have a hunger to grow every day and be taught through the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you living a life united with those of like mind and purpose? Are you living each day boldly and furthering the kingdom of God? living a life of boldness and confidence in the price that Jesus paid for you, that God desires for you, and the Holy Spirit helps you and teaches you and reminds you to be each and every day of your life. God desires this for you. Jesus paid the price for you to live this way. And the Holy Spirit, right now and forevermore until Jesus comes back again at the day of judgment, is there for you. How are you prioritizing this? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just come to you now living a life of hope and confidence in you, Father. We just ask that you speak to us, maybe in a new way today. Father, understanding and lifting us up today that knowing even in times of of difficulty and times of struggle, very much like we're here today, that even though we're, we're not gathered together in one place, that your Holy Spirit is still moving within us right there where we are. God, allow the Holy Spirit to consume us. Just as your scripture teaches, consume us, convict us of our sins, ask and encourage us to ask for forgiveness for those sins and to have that hope in eternal life in Christ, that hope that only comes from Jesus for the price that he paid for us. Father, encourage us to live a life where we, we, we just cannot hesitate or ever stop growing and inspire to better understand your word and apply it to our lives. Father, speak to us today. Be with us in our walk as you promise you will be through that presence and power of the Holy Spirit today. And encourage us to live a life boldly for you each and every day. For to you we give the glory and honor. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your guidance. Most of all, we thank you for your love. Guide us and keep us. And lead us in the way that we should go. In Jesus' name, amen.